Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here sharing some of the work in progress um, from my year and a half so far as a pre presidential scholar. Um, so as Chris has said, I'm working across several departments at Columbia to study pregnancy and the transition to motherhood in the context of trauma history. And today I particularly want to discuss how narratives and neuroscience can be integrated in the study of this challenging topic. And the background to this is that through many uh, groundbreaking longitudinal studies, we have learned about how trauma in early childhood can place someone at risk for many different physical and psychological health problems in the future. Um, adverse childhood experiences are traumatic experiences that impact brain development, causing a cascade of reactions across the life course. And these types of trauma could include things like emotional abuse and neglect, physical and sexual violence, mental illness in parents. And evidence has increasingly shown that the effects of trauma can be carried on intergenerationally. So the intergenerational transmission of trauma refers to an effect we see in offspring as a result of parental exposures. So pregnancy and the early postnatal period naturally are critical periods to study because this is a conduit by which maternal trauma can affect the next generation. Uh, thinking about trauma history as an exposure that can affect offspring even before birth is of great concern and there are really important lines of research devoted to learning about how past experiences can be embedded biologically and how this can be transmitted to the next generation. But um, what, re what receives less attention is about the experience of women themselves as they become mothers against this background of trauma. And by this I mean that we should consider ways in which this big transition in someone's life, um, in women's lives, may be shaped by their past experiences. So for example, when thinking about survivors of violence, there could be things to do with this experience of pregnancy and this life transition that could be a psychologically a more intense stressor. So pregnancy and the transition to motherhood often comes with reflection on one's own past, one's own parents and upbringing, and when that past involves significant trauma, this reflection could result in old trauma resurfacing and being re-experienced. And in psychoanalytic theory, this phenomenon has been referred to as the ghosts in the nursery that can seem to haunt this period. We see some evidence of difficulty adjusting over this period that reflected in data that shows trauma history is a risk factor for perinatal depression and anxiety adverse pregnancy outcomes, and dampened sensitivity in caregiving behaviours. Uh, so the research question I want to focus on today, are what is the psychological, emotional experience of pregnancy and this transition like for trauma survivors and those with trauma histories? And also, since not all people who have histories of trauma go on to experience any psychological difficulty in future, what are the individual factors that contribute to risk or resilience? So to begin to address this complicated question, uh, these are the, the multiple methods covering different layers of understanding that I'm using in my research. Um, and beginning with narrative and qualitative methods, these give us insight into the lived experience, we hear participants' stories in their own words, and from this we identify themes that emerge. But going further, using narrative analysis may also give insight beyond the words that are actually spoken. Then self-report data, like questionnaires, begin to aggregate some of these experiences into quantitative data, which is useful for making group comparisons. Um, neuroimaging is another means of understanding ways in which trauma may influence the brain um, and therefore cognition and behaviour in ways that may not be accessible to awareness. And finally, behavioural observations which come from videotaped mother-infant interactions which are systematically coded using established coding systems and these allow an, uh, an outside observer to measure behaviour and look at the quality of the relationship. So all of this data collection is very much a work in progress. Firstly, for today, I want to focus on uh, looking at the qualitative data to begin with. So first and foremost, narratives give us unique insight into the lived experience. And this is really important when thinking about trauma exposure. Trauma is a vastly heterogeneous experience 
The same experience may lead to any number of different outcomes among different people. So qualitative studies and narrative studies allow us to go beyond studying just an exposure and its sequelae. We can also get insight into the meaning and significance um, that these experiences have for an individual through their stories and the way that they tell them. Um, Using narrative methods is also a positive step towards making sure different voices are heard, particularly of marginalised groups who might be facing multiple forms of adversity and who is, and may not always be well represented in research. So using these methods, the participant is really regarded as the expert in their life and the job of the interviewer is to work collaboratively with them to produce meaning. So the methods I'm using are semi-structured interviews. They last about 40 minutes to an hour where women are asked to describe their experiences of pregnancy and the transition to motherhood and their parenting experiences. And this is aided by something called photo elicitation where participants are asked to bring photographs that speak to their experiences around that tr transition. And the idea is that these photographs help to open up the conversation, to talk about things that may be hard to put into words spontaneously, and they're also a prompt. They help someone to really cast their minds back to how they felt during um, those key moments. And there are two samples I'm drawing on for these interviews. The first is healthy women who are recruited during their pregnancy from Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Columbia Medical Center. And this is through the Perinatal Pathways Lab, which is led by my mentor, Dr. Catherine Monk. And it's a, a big team effort to collect this data. The second sample is from the Bronx Family Justice Center, which is a center for people who um, are survivors of domestic or gender-based violence. And it's in, um, intended to be a one-stop location for them to get connected to services for free. And recently, this has included on-site mental health services. That was a partnership set up through the women's program at Columbia Psychiatry. And so again, this really is a team effort, and I, I want to mention these key collaborators up front. So these interviews are still in their early stages. Um, for now, for this talk, I just want to focus on two women who both have significant trauma histories but they were recruited from different settings and um, as you'll see, they really have quite different stories to tell as they talk about their experiences over pregnancy and parenting. So the first participant I want to talk about, she um, has a significant history of childhood adversity. This includes pronounced abuse and neglect in childhood. And then um, more recently in her pregnancy, her partner also actually left her when she became pregnant and she was worried that this could cause problems for her emotionally with the new baby, but ultimately says it didn't. Um, she preemptively attended therapy and describes a happy experience. So I'm gonna share a couple of quotes from, from these interviews. Um, she says, I've gotten mental help a little bit, basically just to ensure I didn't get postpartum depression and that I had some type of guide. I wanted to make sure I knew what were the key points of being sad or me knowing what's happening and making myself sad. It was about enjoying the kids and being grateful for being healthy, having a baby coming along great. She describes pregnancy and delivery as being easy and positive experiences. She's looking at a photograph um, to, on the morning that she had the baby. She says, um, I had just been breastfeeding him and my daughter took this picture of us. It's our first picture together. It was a good morning and an easy labor. I wasn't exhausted or anything. And even looking at that picture now, she says it makes her feel happy. She says it's very heartwarming. It brings happiness. New life brings happiness, so definitely I was waiting for him eagerly. And then when asked to describe the experience of adjusting to motherhood, she emphasizes having really outstanding support despite some, some financial hardships, including an injury. Um, so she says, I'm injured and I'm pregnant. It's not a good time because there's no funds. And I was going through, I still am going through some hard stuff, but there's always little angels to help you out. I call them angels because they come up at the right moment. Throughout the whole pregnancy, it's been like that. I didn't have my baby shower, but I did have my church family. They surprised me, and with what they gave me, I didn't have to buy the baby anything. I'm not stressing too much. I'm stressing, but not too much. And in talking about parenting, she has reflected on her own upbringing, and she describes how this influenced her parenting. 
Um, she does say, I actually hit them once. I don't wear a belt because my mom used to hit me with belts, so I don't have a belt in the house, and I didn't want to overdo it like my mom used to on me. It's a really bad, negative, and heavy type of weight. I didn't like, heavy type of um, energy. I didn't like that. I didn't want to be like my mother. When I was 16, she was an addict. I knew I had to be better than that. So that's why at 18, I went to this medical assistant schooling to make sure I did something better for us. And finally, her you know, advice and, and parting was, if, I think if you as a mom, you don't ever stress yourself, everything will go smoothly. I've experienced that with all my children. Okay, so th that's our first participant, um, participant story. The second participant I want to um, share with you, she also has a, a history of childhood trauma and, and also in um, adulthood, a, a history of severe intimate partner violence. Um, and she describes pregnancy as a particularly distressing experience itself. Um, she says, during the pregnancy, I felt like a complete alien. My body felt invaded. I would cry. I was very emotional and I couldn't stand that. During labour, there was too much going on with my body that made me feel abnormal. Even filling up with milk made me feel abnormal. And I know everybody's saying, oh, it's such a beautiful experience. To me, I was traumatised because I couldn't believe that a little person came out of my body and she was grey. So it freaked me out to an extent. So she's describing the pregnancy itself as particularly distressing and this becomes more pronounced as she then goes on to describe her experiences in um, labour and delivery and then she even makes explicit connections between her past traumatic experiences um, coming up for her in the delivery room. So she says the whole experience started off badly and then all the doctors just sticking, I felt because of my experiences in life, I just felt kind of violated. Everything is exposed, everybody's in the room, this person keeps coming up and sticking their fingers in me, everybody was in the room and it seemed like everybody wasn't listening to what I was saying when I told them how I feel. It felt like I was itching from the back of my eyelids, I cried and told them I don't want this no more, and she start, she, look, I'm starting to scratch now. It's affecting her as she's telling the story in the interview. It wasn't like most people say, oh, it's a beautiful experience. I felt just like a piece of meat on the slab. And then finally, um, in talking about her experience parenting, she emphasises that her daughter has been her primary source of social support um, and emotional, su emotional support since she was born. She says, parenting now, my daughter is like my little trooper and every time I get a little down, it's her that comes and picks me up. She does little things. I don't even know if she knows that she's doing it, but she does and I love her for it. I want her to be happy and it hurts me sometimes because it feels like I'm taking away from her childhood by letting her feel like she has to take care of me. That's what makes me feel bad and that's what's hurtful because I want to give her what I didn't have and I want her to live her life to the fullest and be the best person she could be. And that's why, that's what makes, makes me feel bad because she had to experience all this stuff and see mummy go through this. So there are many different messages we could draw from an excerpt like this um, and we'll have our own reactions to hearing stories like that. For now we might say that it's a striking way in which this participant sees her own trauma um, and how it negatively affects her daughter. She's sad about this and also now she must deal with the gap that she perceives between what she wants for her daughter, how the kind of parent she wants to be, versus what she has been able to offer. So these kinds of narratives are obviously extremely powerful to hear. Um, we are still in the process of interviewing women using both grounded theory approaches and then more narrative-based methods. Um, and through this, we'll be working through that data over the next year or so and begin to identify themes that emerge, patterns that become that seem salient. But a question for an interdisciplinary group like this is in practical terms, right now, what do we do with this kind of data? And why should neuroscientists care about knowledge gained from qualitative or narrative methods? Uh, firstly, it could mean that the hypotheses that we test ultimately are grounded in realities and lived experiences. Um, it could even prompt exploratory studies into mechanisms and outcomes into uh, brain, even, even brain regions that may not have been considered in previous studies 
that might be based on findings from uh, preclinical models or other types of data. Um, it may also suggest to us what potential risk and resilience factors might be. And in this way, um, in a very practical way, it can also tell us what covariates might be important to collect data on if we can and include in our quantitative analyses. Um, or we can use this information uh, when deciding how generalizable results are or identify subpopulations who might be in need of special attention. So now I want to move on to look at another type of data that we have collected, which is the quantitative self-report measures. Um, these have some real advantages uh, since they're widely used and they're well-validated measures of psychological well-being and functioning. And they allow us to ask these questions at a group level and also can help us compare our sample to other groups in the published literature. So this sample is from the group of healthy pregnant women from Columbia Medical Center I mentioned. Um, this table just gives you a sense of the basic demographics of the sample. Um, there is a spread of socioeconomic factors like income and education. The sample is predominantly Latina women and about a third are receiving public assistance. And this is a multifaceted uh, longitudinal cohort study with uh, a number of self-report measures completed in, in interviews during pregnancy and in the postpartum. These include uh, self-reported measures of exposure to trauma in childhood with the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. This is administered uh, during pregnancy in the first trimester. And then measures looking at stress and mental health, specifically relating to the experience of pregnancy and transition to motherhood via the um, prenatal distress questionnaire. And this focuses on distress that is specific to pregnancy. For example, being unhappy with physical symptoms and physical experience of pregnancy, being worried about the baby, worried about future adjustment to parenting, um, relationship and, and financial factors and so on. Then in the postpartum, the parental reflective functioning questionnaire um, gets at cognitions that are relevant to parenting about how um, one understands the mental state of another, specifically the infant. Um, the maternal postnatal attachment scale is a self-report measure of attachment and relationship quality. And then the Hamilton anxiety and depression scales are clinical ratings of depression and anxiety. Uh, so uh, firstly, just to describe the sample in terms of trauma history, the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire asks about these five different uh, forms of childhood maltreatment. The percentages here show the portion of the sample that reported each kind of maltreatment. Um, those categories aren't exclusive, so uh, just under half the sample reported at least one kind of maltreatment in childhood, and close to 30% reported two or more forms of maltreatment. So in this overall healthy group, we do have a significant portion reporting histories of childhood maltreatment. Uh, so first I wanna talk about data related to one of my core questions, which is whether history of childhood trauma uh, was associated with the experience of pregnancy and the transition to parenting. So childhood trauma was looked at in terms of the, the sum total score on the childhood trauma questionnaire and prenatal distress was looked at with that um, prenatal distress questionnaire. And um, in this graph, I've looked at trimester three, but th this uh, was the same pattern of results across pregnancy. Um, and what we see is that uh, tra child trauma history was associated on this scale with prenatal distress, that pregnancy specific measure of, of distress. Um, and secondly, we looked at maternal well-being in the peripartum in the form of depression symptoms measured by the Hamilton Depression Scale at four months. And here we also see that childhood trauma history was associated with depression symptoms at that time point. So this is at four months postpartum. And interestingly, when you control uh, in a regression analysis for prenatal distress, um, the effect of childhood trauma on depression at four months was no longer significant. So there's more work to do in passing out these associations and more data that we will be able to bring in. Um, but so far, it suggests that some of the increased risk for postpartum depression among those with trauma histories may be partly due to elevated distress related to the pregnancy itself. And we're also interested in looking at um, associations between pregnancy-specific distress 
um, and, and attachment in the postpartum. So the data on the y-axis here is from that self-report uh, attachment measure, the maternal postnatal attachment scale. There's three subscales. So this subscale I've showed here is called hostility. Um, this may sound like it refers to um, very outwardly or, or negative or aggressive behaviours, but really it's much more subtle. Um, the items on this scale that is termed hostility is things like I feel annoyed or irritated by the baby, I resent things I had to give up because of the baby, sometimes the baby is deliberately trying to upset me. And what's interesting is that for women with trauma history specifically, um, so the, those are those in the red marking on the graph, there is a suggestion here that pregnancy-related distress is actually perhaps being carried on into the postpartum in a subtle way to affect her um, representation of the infant. And there are two other subscales on this measure. That was the quality of interaction and the pleasure in interaction. Those scales that uh, kind of refer to the more positive and enjoyable aspects of attachment were not affected by stress in distress in pregnancy in either group. Um, so, of course, a limitation at this point in time is that we're talking about self-report data on attachment, um, which doesn't always correlate well with observer-rated measures of attachment and parenting behaviours. So it will be interesting soon to look at those observer-rated measures um, as outcomes. And a, a potentially relevant cognitive factor that has been identified is called reflective functioning. And this comes from psychoanalytic work. Um, and recently, a self-report scale was published to assess reflective functioning in relation to parenting. So essentially, this is the ability to read and understand behaviour in light of um, underlying mental states and intentions. And it's particularly relevant in parenting as parents need to um, not only attend to the behaviour of an infant, but also the underlying mental state in order to respond appropriately. Um, it's a way to measure the internal representation that a mother has of an infant and their mental state. Um, questions are things like, I try to see situations through the eyes of my child. Um, if this capacity is low, there's a potential for distorted representations, um, which could be accompanied by less sensitive caregiving behaviour. And in the preliminary data, we're seeing that maternal trauma history was actually not associated with reflective functioning ability via this scale. Um, so this ability has been suggested as, uh, as acting as a buffer between early adversity and adjustment to parenting. So if someone has a history of trauma, but then as an adult they have reflective skills and they're in tune to mental states of themselves and others, um, they will adjust better in this period. And so maybe that is the case for this sample in general. And lastly, I want to talk about what we might be able to gain in the future from studying cognition as well as brain structure and function in the postpartum. So the transition to motherhood is thought of as a developmental period. It's characterised by dramatic changes in the body that accompany cognitive and behavioural changes, which, from an evolutionary perspective, is an adaptive shift in orientation towards the mother-infant dyad. And in humans, this in particularly includes sharpened social and emotional abilities, becoming highly attuned to an infant's needs. Um, Winnicott first saw the interactions between mother and infant as uh, central to the development of the infant's internal world. He described prim uh, primary maternal preoccupation um, as a phase in which the mother is extremely attuned to the needs and the wants of the child, um, that emotional state is so intense, it's described as almost being an illness um, were it not for the pregnancy. So this physical, emotional and behavioural process that allows that, the mother to identify with her infant while also allowing the infant to develop his or her own self. Um, so to uh, expanding on evidence from animal models, we're increasingly understanding that this really profound behavioural and cognitive shift is maybe not surprisingly associated with uh, plasticity in the brain. So um, we know that pregnancy is now a, a t is a time of um, heightened neuroplasticity and, and continues into the perinatal period. 
And very, very briefly, um, there is evidence in functional plasticity, including adaptation of the brain's reward system. So the baby becomes a very uh, rewarding stimuli and the focus of attention. Um, and parenting behavior is also driven by brain circuits involved in processing emotion, um, as well as in executive functions. And in their action together, these allow for both a regulation of a mother's emotional response to infant cues, things like babies, the sound of babies crying, while simultaneously organizing an appropriate behavioral response. And only a, a very small number of studies have looked at changes to brain structure from before pregnancy to after. Um, this one study um, recently is an example um, which demonstrated gray matter volume reductions in some specific areas of the brain in healthy women after pregnancy and showed that these changes actually persisted well beyond the peripartum. And the hypothesis is that those changes are adaptive. More change was associated with more secure attachment, um, which has a huge adaptive advantage. And it's interesting to note that those brain changes uh, were specifically associated with this measure of lack of hostility. And this was the same behavioral outcome that I mentioned earlier um, being correlated with prenatal distress. So in, in those with a trauma history. So a question for us to investigate going forward is whether distress during pregnancy could interfere in some way with those, what would be adaptive brain changes, particularly for those with trauma histories. There is reason to hypothesize that women with a history of trauma may show differences in, in neuroplasticity in pregnancy. We know that women who have histories of trauma show dampened maternal sensitivity and less secure attachment with their infant, which sets the stage for poorer emotional and behavioral development of infants. And uh, this is one way in which those intergenerational cycles of adversity could be perpetuated. So the possibility that these patterns may have um, origins or being able, be able to be seen at a neural level isn't clear at this point. So a next step is to investigate whether those adaptive brain changes might be dampened in those with trauma histories. Um, there is a small amount of evidence that have looked at, have shown differences in brain responses to infant stimuli. Um, these are responses that are, have been associated with um, parent-infant attachment and emotion regulation. So two examples are that traumatized mothers have shown increased amygdala activations in one sample um, in response to videos of dyadic interactions, which might suggest hypervigilance. Um, in contrast, in another study, there was a blunted amygdala response noted in response to infant distress cues um, in, among women with unresolved relational trauma. So we see um, different patterns of results even in the same brain region here. So there's more research needed to understand neural mechanisms and individual differences um, in which trauma history can affect maternal behavior. So today I've just given a glimpse of the first layers of what will soon be a very rich data set. Uh, those semi-structured interviews are still being conducted and still being analyzed. Soon, using grounded theory and narrative analysis, we're going to start synthesizing um, that information, looking for patterns and themes of individual differences that can shape experience over this time. Second, as I mentioned, we'll be using neuroimaging to look at whether trauma history and distress in the perinatal period can alter those um, pregnancy-related brain changes and response to infant cues. So we already, the neuroimaging is, is um, ongoing as well. And so while narrative and self-report data are really important and valuable, looking at the brain might tell us something different about ways in which information is processed in a way that might not be accessible to awareness but could still be associated with behavior and development in a way that really matters. Um, and then finally, using uh, looking at the observer-rated um, videotaped interactions will complement the self-reported measures of attachment that we already have, maybe allowing us to see observable differences in caregiving if they're there. So ultimately, integrating these many different levels of understanding will be the ultimate goal and challenge for this interdisciplinary work in the future. Thank, Thank you. you.